Let's now journey into the world of art in landscape. Subodh Kirkar, founding director of the Museum of Goa, has created a huge body of work based on Goa's histories and has exhibited widely in India and abroad. Talking to him will be Chennai-based theatre person Tezi Katari. Over to you. Good evening. At the outset, I'd like to say how delighted I am to be sharing this space with Dr. Subodh Kerkar. I'd like to tell you a little about him before he takes you away with his, with his art. Subodh started off as a doctor, a medical doctor. Until 25 years ago, he decided to give up medicine and devote his time to his love, to his art. At that point, he was a landscape artist, working in watercolors. Through the years, his interest changed, and until now, and he's become a conceptual artist, working on art installations and sculptures. Most of his art installations are done on beaches, and they are washed by the tide as the water comes in. To Subodh, the ocean is not only a master, but also a muse. He has been described as a political artist and an activist. Many of his works have an underlying tone of socialism or politics. Two years ago, he started something in Goa, which was the largest space for contemporary art. It's called the Museum of Goa. Approximately 60,000 people have visited it till date. Subodh firmly believes that art should be available to everyone, not just to the elite. And with that, I give you Subodh. Okay, Over I think you. I will stand up and speak because I like to stand up to my convictions. Uh, well, it's very difficult to be sandwiched between terror and the dream girl. Well, I gave up my medicine to pursue my interest in visual arts 25 years ago. I, I ran a hospital for about eight years in Kalangut in Goa. When I started my hospital, most of my patients were fishermen. But within a few years, there was a big boom in the tourism industry. And then suddenly, 80% of my patients were British tourists suffering from loose motions. So the idea of spending my lifetime treating British loose motions was not very palatable. And I thought India has taken enough shit from the British for 150 years and he didn't want to take any more. So I gave up my medicine and now I pursue my passion, visual art. Uh, today I'm going to give you about 20 minutes of presentation about land art. That is what I practice. And then we will have a conversation with Tehzeeb. Um, art in the landscape. Uh, art in the landscape is a little bit different from landscape architecture because I see a lot of different kinds of landscape architecture. Some people are making Greek uh, pillars and some Roman arches in the garden. Landscape art is different and um, land art is a little different. Here, you use landscape as a kind of a canvas. So let me start with my first work. This is a rock which is projecting into the ocean in Goa, in a place called Anjuna. Now this rock, during low tide, it's above the water, and during high tide, it goes under the water. The rock is like a kind of a ramp for the waves to stage a catwalk. So I looked at this rock and I decided to create a work because I'm a kind of an ocean artist. I believe uh, that my work is very much influenced, washed by the ocean. And the oceans of the world have separated the continents, but the oceans are also responsible for connecting the continents. Civilizations grew on the banks of the oceans, and the oceans have seen it all. In a way, the history of human civilization is dissolved in the ocean. So I created a perfect kind of a bowl, cowed out in the rock, and then, during the high tide, it fills up. I call it the earth bowl. Uh, this is a kind of a symbolic uh, uh, 
work where you celebrate the ocean, celebrate the connectedness of the continents. And a little child um, I mean, offered me a lovely pose in my bowl. So this is a permanent installation in, uh, in Goa. This is a work where you give back to the ocean in its own language. This is a kind of an ocean, a wave I have created in metal. When two people live with each other, they tend to become like one another, each other. They're very much influenced. So the coast, with the constant proximity of the ocean and the fish, has developed scales. So this is a work called Scales. This was sponsored by Jindal, so I had enough access to a lot of steel. Now here, uh, this was the accidental installation which I created. I had a disc in copper, which was supposed to be a lamp uh, for some, one of the hotel receptions. So I went with this disc to the beach. I dug a perfect crater in the sand, put the disc on the top of it with a metal rod. There were electrical bulbs underneath the disc. And I ran a wire under the sand to a beach shack. And when I put the lights on, this is what happened. And I couldn't believe my own eyes because I had created almost kind of a new planet. This was an accidental installation, and I call it the 10th planet because I almost felt like a god that I have created this planet. And then this idea of using sand and light, uh, sort of I started doing a lot of more works, and these are the other works. Every child, every child makes a sculpture which is a cone in the sand. So this is in memory of the cones which I made as a child. Only thing, there's a little moat around it, and then there are electrical bulbs. When you ask a child to draw a sunset, a child would do the sun and some triangular lines, two, three lines in the form of a triangle. So I'm just started imagining, I started imagining that perhaps the sand remembers the sunset. And these are just grooves in the sand with electrical bulbs on the other side of the groove. And this is called the memory of sunset on the sand. So this experiment of just digging holes in the sand, putting shells continued, and I must have done many, many works with just sand and light and shells. Um, when I was a doctor, and I gave, it, I gave my medicine up, I was a very good doctor, and I, was, I ran a very successful hospital. But, well, my calling for art was stronger, so I decided to pursue art. And when I started doing watercolors on the roadside, my patients felt, what is this doctor doing? He had such a nice practice, and now he sits on the roadside and paints watercolors. But then, I started collecting shells and started planting shells on the beach. Now they thought this is a gone case. <laughs> this guy must be, because the idea of an adult planting shells on the beach is unthinkable for most people. So this is harvesting of the beach, where I go with a lot of school kids and we collect shells. And by the way, these sacks are made out of cement, they're sculptures. And then I started planting shells. Now this is a work, one of my favorite works. Uh, there's a beach in Goa on the way to the airport called Goa Vella. I made a perfect form of a moon using shells which we collected on that beach. Because as you know, the moon is responsible for the high tides and the low tides. So this is my moon. And then I waited for the high tide to come and drown the moon, which is the creator of the tides. Hmm? So this, is, uh, this has many different layers. So I have been working with shells, all kinds of shells. Uh, these are mussel shells, which I have planted all over the world. And mind you, I did make a living planting shells because I was selected in the, in the Biennale in Korea. And well, I was awarded some 8 lakhs rupees for planting shells. So it is it's also a profession. So these are the shells which I planted in Dubai. Uh, this is in Mumbai. This is also in Dubai. This is in Denmark. Uh, recently, I was in Denmark and I planted shells. And the shells in India, or in Goa, are, are, are green. And in Denmark, the shells are blue. So I took a few thousand shells from India and then uh, used a lot of blue shells from Denmark. And I almost felt like an ambassador of the Republic of Mussel Shells of India going and <laughs> meeting the mussel shells of Denmark. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you should see the original. I mean, it's very, very ethereal. Uh, these are green shells from Goa. They're not painted. This is the original color. And you know, uh, there are many ideas which are inside this, which I will talk about when I have a conversation with Tehzeeb. Uh, here, there's a cross, because this is a celebration of the ocean. Um, 
I have a soft corner to the Tibetans. And I was lucky when Dalai Lama visited Goa, I was requested to escort him. So uh, there is a lot of Tibetan community in Goa, and they sell jewelry. And uh, I thought uh, that they are quite different from most of the other uh, jewelry sellers in Goa. They do not go behind you. They do not say, please buy. They just sit like Buddhas there. And they're very tranquil, almost like Tukaram's shop. Eh? And uh, so when I, the, the Lai Lama is in Goa, I thought that I will do uh, some kind of uh, installation in support of the Tibetan cause. Because I have hiked a lot in Himalayas. And the Lungtas, the Tibetan prayer flags which uh, adorn the slopes of Himalayas, have always interested me. And the sound which it creates, the sounds the flags create with the wind, is also very divine. And it's almost this, uh, this, uh, the kind of a sound, a sound of the universe, sound of the cosmos. And um, I decided that since I have never seen these Tibetan flags on the seaside, I will have an installation with the Tibetan flags on the seaside. And it is almost like an act of the ocean praying for the freedom of the snow. So I bought 2,000 flags and planted them in, on a beach in Vagator in Goa in the form of a spiral. It was called Unfolding of a Dream. And then the, His Holiness said uh, he requested about 300 monks to come and join my uh, installation. So we had a procession where the Tibetan monks sort of uh, with mashals uh, uh, sang prayers. And each of this flag had an electrical bulb underneath it. And this is what happened at night. So <clears throat> this is an installation. So I'm, a lot of my works have a lot of social, political, historical undercurrents. Um, uh, mo as I told you, I was a doctor, and initially a lot of my patients were fishermen. And so I could look at the life of a fisherman from a very close angle, and I realized the inseparability of a life of a fisherman and the ocean. So, so I started working with fishermen as my material. So I worked with 100 fishermen, and this is what we did. So the fishermen become a keel of a boat. The fishermen become a boat. The fishermen become the fish bone. So I mean, many a times there is a, I mean, most people feel that art is essentially about a landscape, about a portrait, or about a kind of painting a ways. But there are many things you can do uh, sort of to create uh, art. This is a kind of oceanic ritual with fishermen, the fishermen waiting. Uh, this is a work which is done, I'm showing it here, especially because the tsunami had affected uh, Chennai. When tsunami came, it did not come to the east coast, uh, to the west coast. And, but on the second day after tsunami, I was walking on the seaside and I saw a lot of chapels. And I couldn't stop thinking that this could be chapels of the people the sea took away. So I collected a truck full of chapels and just arranged them on the beach as a kind of a memorial to those who were washed away. And I must tell you that no, I didn't have to tell anybody that this is a memorial. People just stopped and prayed. So that is a kind of a power of art. Um, I have been exploring histories. Uh, there's a huge, I mean, connection between Arabia and India, right from the Harappan time, from the Indus Valley civilization, the Arab ships used to come to, uh, to the west coast of India. There was a huge trade. And then to celebrate this navigational history, I created sculptures using old boats from Goa, and I was invited to show them in Dubai Art Fair next to the Burj. So this is sort of uh, stirring histories with sculptures made out of boats. And most of these boats are about 50, 60 years old. They're wooden boats. And the fishermen now are going in for fiberglass boats. So I buy the old boats and convert them into sculpture. Because when I convert an old boat into a sculpture, there are many things happening here. What happens is I'm the, every boat, which is about 70, 80 years old, has a story. The boat has lovely marks created by the ocean. It has uh, marks of the ropes of the nets which were pulled full of fish. And all this history, the story of the boat becomes part of my installation, part of my sculpture. So it is in a way using history for using as a material for sculpture. Uh, this is glass inside the boat. The boat remembers water because glass when lit appears like water and the glass remembers the sand because uh, glass is made from sand. So it's exploring ancestry of materials. These are my boats. Uh, there was a discussion about terrorism. I was posed a very interesting question by Sahid Mirza, the great filmmaker. He asked me if 
we had to describe the present world in two words, what the words would be. I thought and thought, and the conclusion is, the present world can be described in two words, terrorism and telecommunication. It's terrorism and telecommunication. So one side you have uh, the electronic circuit board, telecommunication, and then the bullets represent the terrorism. And there's a big paradox here, because I believe that terrorism is a product of non-communication between groups, religions, societies, ideas. And today, in spite of such a great development in telecommunication, where everybody has a mobile phone, which is even a bigger computer than what was there in Apollo 11. So everyone has this, but in spite of that, there is no communication between uh, nations and groups and religions. And I think that is the cause of terrorism. And when Bombay attacks happened, I decided to create a work based on Mumbai terror attacks. This is my sculpture of a terrorist. A terrorist, it was discussed today, is somebody who is brainwashed. A donkey can be programmed to go from place A to place B with the load on the back. A terrorist is something like that. Kassav was 19 years old. I mean, anybody who is 19 cannot be a bad boy. He has been programmed. And so, a terrorist for me is a robot with a donkey's head. And this is what I did. And then I had these masks of donkeys, 10 masks for 10 terrorists, and we had 10 actors performing uh, the whole episode, what happened in Mumbai. So this is, uh, hmm? so this is, um, well, I will go through them fast. And this was just an accidental installation. I was just playing with some red pigment, which was water soluble, and I just sprinkled it in the water. And then it's just my luck that a he buffalo just walks in there. <laughs> and he buffalo is a vehicle of Yamai, the god of death. And this is a picture which is completely accidental. Accidents happen when you are all the time involved in uh, the creation of art. Uh, well, this is um, indigo. Now, indigo is a, uh, is a pigment which is supposed to have uh, seduce the world. And indigo is only growing in India and a few other Asian countries. And it was exported to Europe. In Europe, there was some pigment which was called wad. And this wad was not as good as indigo. And when indigo started uh, going to Europe, the German farmers protested. And they actually had a strike to stop Indian indigo from coming to Germany. But ultimately, I mean, in Gandhi, his first satyagraha on Indian soil was in uh, 1917 in Champaran against the, uh, for the, in support of the indigo workers. Uh, but in 19, and Gandhi actually succeeded in giving some concessions to the indigo workers. But then, in the same year, something very important happened. In 1917, Mr. Bayer in Germany discovered the artificial method of creating uh, indigo. And that was the end of the whole indigo crop. 3,500 kilometers, square kilometers of land was under indigo cultivation. So nobody knows this story of uh, Bayer discovering indigo. Everybody basically knows that Gandhi succeeded, but then the indigo plantations were completely wiped off. So what I do is during low tide, I sprinkle the rocks in Goa on the seaside with indigo and wait for the high tide to come and wash them away. So these are all works created in memory of indigo. Well, and now I think we could uh, have a little conversation because we decided that, okay, I will just give an initial sort of a, a idea of what exactly I do and what I mean by land art, and then we could uh, have the That's conversation. Lovely. Thank you. That's lovely. Um, Subodh, I've got a few questions. Um, your earth bowl mm -hmm. is permanent, well, yes. more or less. Yes. But there are some pieces, like the moon, the one that gets drowned. Yeah. I mean, don't you feel anything? I mean, you put in so much love and effort and time to create this. Yeah. Well, I mean, all of us are impermanent, and so there's no reason why a work of art should be permanent. But I think I will use a wonderful poem by Tagore to answer that question. Uh, so when I create, uh, I think I would uh, like to have the presentation. So uh, I usually do these installations uh, near the... Uh, inside the high tide line, and then the waves come and wash it away. But there's a lovely poem by Tagore. Tagore says, the, wa I, the waves write their poetry on the sand, and not satisfied, wipe them off over and over again. So in a way, my installations, uh, my poetry on the sand. Um, but sometimes I am tempted to make them permanent. So I sometimes convert them into bronze. So this is the same installation which you saw, the round one. 
uh, with the moon and the tide made into bronze. This is actually in Saudi Arabia on the bank of the Red Sea in, a, in an institution called uh, the King Abdullah University of uh, Science and Technology. Yeah. This is called a drop of the ocean, created again with shells cast in bronze. Yeah. Ah, your seahorse. Yeah. I remember seeing that before. <laughs> there has to be a story about that. Why a seahorse? Why not a crab or a lobster? Or... Well, the seahorse is a lovely story. You know, I belong to a group uh, which is called Anam Prem. Now, this is a very loose group in Goa. And all that we do is once a year, we give a good holiday to the underprivileged people in Goa for three days or so. So sometimes we invite the paraplegics. Sometimes we invite the blind students and just give them a good time for three days. I look after them, take them on a boat cruise, and things like this. So now, last year, we invited 150 transgenders, hijdas, as our guests. Now, I have never ever spoken to hijdas as a fellow human being. Most of you must have not, because usually when they come and uh, signal, you just shoo them away, uh, go because they are begging. But this is for the first time that I could actually have an interaction with hijdas on a, I mean, on a human level, uh, understand their lives. And that was fascinating. I made many friends amongst hijdas. And then I thought I must create a work with the hijdas, with the transgenders. And then I suddenly realized that a seahorse is a hijda in the ocean. Because the male seahorse gives birth to the babies. So I worked with 150 transgenders. And we collected shells, and we created this uh, seahorse on the beach. And they, they sort of uh, did a wonderful performance around the seahorse. Yeah. Yeah, that is a performance. Yeah. OK, one of my favorites is missing. I have seen it earlier, but it's the chili. OK. Yeah, well, uh, I've yeah. done a lot of installation with chilies on the beach. Now, why chilies? Um, you will be surprised that chilies are not from India. Chilies come from Brazil, and the Portuguese brought them to India, and it first, they first arrived in Goa, in, somewhere in 1535. India only had pepper. This is a pepper country. And the colonial powers came here, essentially, to control the pepper trade. And they gave us chilies from South America. So if there has to be a monument for chilies, it has to be in Goa, because uh, Goa was a gateway of chilies. I will tell you, I'll give you a little bit of a chili vakyan, chili uh, kirtan. There is no mention of chilies in any Indian scriptures. Vedas do not mention chilies. Upanishads do not mention chilies. The next one is second century BC, Kautilya's Arthashastra. That does not mention chili. The next book is Aine Akbari, written somewhere in 1590 by Abdul Fazl. It has 150 dishes in detail cooked in Akbar's kitchen. But everything with pepper and other spices. No chilies are mentioned. The first mention of chilies in Indian written word is in a poem by a saint poet called Purandar Das. You must be aware of Purandar Das. Now Purandar Das says, Oh, chili, I have seen you become red from green. You have made my food so delicious and tasty. When I eat you, I even forget to utter the name of Vithala. <laughs> that is a kind of a certificate Purandar Das gives to chilies. And that is the first mention of chilies in the Indian uh, written word. So actually, one of my interests as an artist is food history. And it is not just chilies, but many other things. Uh, these are chili sculptures. But this is. Do you, want to tell us, do you want to tell us a little more about some yeah, of those foods? There are foods? so many other food items. Actually, why chilies arrived in India is also an interesting story. When the Portuguese would start from Lisbon, they could not come, they could not sail along the coast of Africa to come to the Cape of Good Hope. They had to go westwards. And during one of these sojourns, they touched Brazil and colonized Brazil. Then Brazil became a stop point. Uh, between Lisbon, Brazil, Cape of Good Hope, and Goa. And so all the plants from Brazil were brought to Goa and vice versa. So today, I mean, whether it is peanuts, ananas, pineapple, I mean, uh, papaya, cashew, everything has come from 
uh, from Brazil. And what the Brazilians eat, so many things have gone from here. So uh, this is sweet potatoes, uh, cashew nut, potatoes, chai is from uh, China, uh, marigold flowers. There is no religious ceremony complete without marigold flowers or marriage here. And marigolds come from South America. Mm? Uh, we in Goa call them rosa. The custard apple. Custard apple, we call it sitafar here. In Brazil, it is called ate. And in Goa, it is called ater. Sitafar, ramfar, hanumanfar are re of these fruits. So, you know, when I study the history of food and present it through my art, I start wondering, I mean, the food which we eat is more foreign than Sonia Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> and I must tell you that, I mean, if we have to do a ghar wapasi program, even before we start thinking about ghar wapasi program, we must do food wapasi program. <laughs> yeah, because we have to start, stop eating everything. We have to stop eating all that which has come from elsewhere. <laughs> well, well, this is um, on a lighter way in uh, Goa's fields, rice fields, grow rice in the uh, monsoons and football in the summer. <laughs> yeah. All right. You had once mentioned your, your interest in Gandhi, mm -hmm. uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Do you have yeah, uh, anything on that? Actually, right now I'm working on a, a huge project on Mahatma Gandhi. And um, uh, this pro project is actually inspired by Mr. Modi. Uh, that's because I started getting really agitated. You might disagree with Gandhi on many fronts, but one thing you can never deny to Gandhi is that his was a politics of love and not the politics of hate. <laughs> and today there's a politics of hate, and I decided instead of just shouting, I must do something proactive, let me propagate Gandhi. And this town here has a, I mean, big connection with Gandhi. Actually, it was in Madurai. Gandhi's, the final avatar in costumes is actually the first time Gandhi wore those, uh, that dress in Madurai. This was on 20th of May, 7th of April, uh, 1924. That was in Madurai. So I uh, decided I will propagate uh, Gandhi. And for the last uh, few years, I have been working with Gandhi. Uh, this is one of my works of Gandhi. It's called The Pillars of the Nation's Conscience. If you see the space uh, in between, there is the head, ears. The space in between the pillars is Gandhi. So actually, the medium of creating this sculpture is, uh, is uh, elements. So I have created Gandhi making with the uh, use of elements. And what I do is, when the pillars rotate, you will find Gandhi walking. That is what I'm doing with Gandhi. Uh, well, I must tell you a few works, uh, things I'm doing with Gandhi because Gandhi is very close to my heart. And I must tell you, after I started studying Gandhi, I have become more peaceful. And actually, uh, I, even, I don't even hate the RSS now. Uh, not the RSS people. I do, I mean, I will oppose their ideology, but I will not hate them. And that is what I have learned from Gandhi. Because Gandhi was never against the British people. He was against the colonial rule. And that is something one must learn from him. And then I started thinking, if Gandhi was alive today, what kind of an agitation would he do? Uh, Gandhi was a very creative man. Whether it is a salt satyagraha or whether it is a Swadeshi satyagraha, it was sort of something totally out of the world. Nobody ever thought that a pinch of salt will shake the British Empire. But he had this vision, and he was so creative in choosing his satyagras. So I started thinking, what would Gandhi do if he were alive today? And I came to the conclusion that he would start an anti-liter satyagraha. That's because the whole country is full of litter. Even Goa, which is so, I mean, I mean wonderful nature, fields, hills, ocean, but litter everywhere, plastic bottles everywhere. And the act of throwing a plastic bottle on the road is an act of violence. It's an act of violence against Mother Nature, and it's an act of violence against yourself. And if you do not throw a plastic bottle, if you're conscious that I'm not going to throw a plastic bottle, I'm not going to throw a chocolate wrapper, that is the first step towards good citizenship. That is an act of 
compassion, of empathy with the nature. And so I decided that I must create a work of art to propagate this idea uh, that we do not litter. So what do I do? I collect 150,000 plastic bottles. Uh, these are plastic bottles from Bhangar and from roadside, and I work with a few hundred school students. Each plastic bottle is cut into a flower, and this is arranged in the field, and this is called a carpet of joy. And every day, 3,000 people visit this. And every day, every, the school students visit, and they take an oath, I shall not litter. So I think Gandhi, every morning, is to have something which he called a Prabhat Ferry for freedom from the British. I think we should have a Prabhat Ferry, freedom from litter. Huh? So these are the works which are, uh, it's actually a work connected with my Gandhi project, and it's an anti-litter project created with bottles. And I'll be most glad to also do it in Chennai, because I think every town, every city, every village should have that I mean, awareness that I shall not litter, because littering is an act of violence. Yeah? I think I will mention uh, we have I'm some time. I'm not sure how much time we have, but I just wondered if you'd like to say something about your Museum of Goa. Yeah, I think I will come to that after Gandhi, because we have some oh, time. I, okay. I have been watching time. Uh, so uh, I think I would like to elaborate a little bit on Gandhi project. Uh, my, I'm creating a Museum of Gandhi uh, in Jharkhand. And this is not just a sort of, uh, uh, I'm not a Gandhi missionary. I'm a Gandhi student. And I'm more interested in propagating his ideas, and especially the idea of compassion, idea of uh, nonviolence. And uh, since I'm an ex-doctor, and uh, uh, Gandhi's great grandson Tushar Gandhi is a friend, and he called up the museum of uh, National Museum of uh, Gandhi in Delhi and says Subodh is going to come and meet you. So the director, Dr. Anamalai, I think is from here. Dr. Anamalai received me, and as soon as I sat in his office. He opened up the cupboard and gave me the medical file of Mahatma Gandhi. Now in this file, there were all the blood reports of Gandhiji, and there were five electric cardiograms. So when I looked at those cardiograms, I said, what can I do with this? Now, uh, as a, I'm a man of science, so as soon as I looked at those cardiograms, I realized that I can convert these cardiograms into Gandhi's heart sounds, because a graph can be converted into sounds. And so I did that, so I have created a work now where you enter a room and you see, you hear Gandhi's heart sounds. Huh? And the other work I'm doing, which is actually very, very important for me, is I'm casting Gandhi's chapels in different sizes in bronze. And there will be a platform where we'll have Gandhi's chapels of all sizes cast in bronze. And you can put your own, fit in, uh, own foot in Gandhi's shoes. I think that is very important. It's a very good act of sort of uh, I mean, relating with Gandhi. So these are the kind of ideas which we are doing with Gandhi, and hopefully it should be successful, and the whole purpose uh, of Gandhi as uh, basically propagating uh, love should be achieved. Because I must tell you, there are machines existing in this country which propagate systematically hate. And that has to stop. That was the, uh, all the speakers for the last two days have been talking about it. And I think the counter machinery for propagation of love is most important for this country. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. now do you want to tell us something about the Museum of Goa? Yeah. Um, well, I will do a little experiment with uh, uh, this audience. Just a simple experiment. I am going to tell you ten names: Subodh Gupta, Sudarshan Shetty, uh, Vishwanathan. Adi Mulam, Riyas Komu, Vasudev Gaitonde, Atul Dodia, uh, Francis Newton Souza, uh, Vivan Sundaram. How many people have heard of this name? Please raise your hands. Yeah, there are uh, quite a few hands here. How many people know the works of these people very well? Raise the hands. There are less, uh, uh, hardly four or five hands. Okay. So now, these are the names of the most important contemporary artists of India. Uh, these are the most important contemporary artists. Uh, two, three of them are from this town. Vishwanathan lives in, and he was here uh, for the last two days. He lives in Paris. Now, to put it in financial terms, just to give an idea, 
Gaitonde sold a work of this size two years ago for 28 crores in a Christ Christie's auction. So that is a financial, but most of the audience here, which is a very educated audience, mind you, is not aware of these names. And that is none of your fault. You are not aware of these names for the simple reason that you never ever had an opportunity to look at the works of this artist. And I will tell you to put it in sort of a, a perspective, not knowing this artist is almost like not knowing the dream girl. <laughs> huh? It's the same way not, not knowing who is Abhitabh Bachchan. It is like not knowing who is Kumar Gandharva or who is uh, uh, some of the most important uh, Lata Mangeshkar. Uh, but most people do not know this. Contemporary art is only for the select few. In a country of 135 crores, not more than 100,000 people know the works of the artist I mentioned, and nobody, uh, they do not know any contemporary art in India. And the same one lakh people in, uh, in Delhi, Chennai, Bombay, the same people. And because most people feel that the contemporary art is for them, the richy rich, not for us. And that's because apart from Delhi, where we have the National Gallery of Modern Art, there is no other place in the whole country where you can see a sampling of the works of contemporary artists of this country. And when I gave up my medicine, I got scared. I said, am I going to devote my life for just one lakh people in this country? That was scary. So I decided we must create a museum where everybody can visit. So the Museum of Goa, which we have started in Goa, is the outcome of this concern that we have to break this cultural barrier and take contemporary art to the masses. And uh, why is it important to understand contemporary art? I will tell you a very nice story. In 1960s, this is a literary festival, so I think this story is relevant. In 1960s, in Mexico, there was a gentleman, uh, a rich man, he came to the conclusion that a lot of problems in the world are caused because people do not read. And what does he do? He decided to start bookshops. And what did he call these bookshops? He calls them Liberia Gandhi. So there are 36 Liberia Gandhis in Mexico. You can go to the internet and check up. The buildings are marvelous buildings. The same way, art is very important because connection with arts there are many, many functions of art, but one of the most important functions of art is to tell you that there are other points of views. We, it's, there's a very famous poem by Rumi. It says, beyond the field of the right and beyond the field of the wrong, there is another field. Let us meet there. So art holds your finger and just takes you to that field, which is beyond the field of right and wrong. And that is what art teaches you. And it is very important to connect with art because only then we create societies which are more plural and more tolerant. Hmm? So I will be very, very happy if I mean, you visit the Museum of Goa and connect with it because that is one of the largest private spaces in the whole country showing contemporary art. Um, if anyone has any questions, we'd like to take some. There is a sport, uh, sports ministry in the central government. Is there an art ministry in the central government? In any state is having an art ministry? Yeah, this is a very so good question. Uh, I was actually wanting to uh, touch upon that subject. We have uh, the Ministry of Culture. But the problem is, one of the best things I liked about this festival, the Lit for Life festival, is we had cinema, we had theater, we had uh, uh, music, uh, we had uh, people discussing varied subjects. And I think it is very important that arts talk to each other. It is very important that architecture talks to poetry, and poetry talks to sculpture, and sculpture talks to painting, and painting talks to uh, technology. So it's very important that everything talks to each other. Otherwise, it is like PWD, water supply department, and, uh, and the electricity department. They do the road, and the other departments start digging it. <laughs> They're not on talking terms. So arts need to talk to each other. I must tell you that. Uh, Lalit Kala Academy, which looks after visual art, and the Sahitya Academy are in the same building in Delhi. And in their history for the last 60 years, they have not had a single joint program. They are not on talking terms. So I think festivals like this 
they have to address this and they have to make art speak to each other. So there is a ministry of culture, but the problem is many of these departments don't talk to each other. And, uh, uh, and another most important thing why this is happening is if you have a heart problem, where do you go? Do you go to the minister of health or uh, secretary of health or do you go to a doctor? You go to a doctor. But here, the problem is, when it is a, uh, I mean, you have to choose a sculpture in the public area, the MLA or the IS officer does it himself. He does not consult the uh, curators. So it is very important that art is handled by professionals and not by somebody who is not exposed. Uh, so I'm deeply impressed and touched by your art. Uh, but there was one, um, one work of yours which, uh, which, which, uh, which had a discordant note for me. Uh, there was the terrorist which, who was depicted as a donkey and a robo. But isn't, there, isn't that a blanket statement and you know, isn't there many other factors involved and you know, it's, it's a very layered uh, thing and it's much more complex than that. Yeah. So, uh, I feel, you know, um, I want you to... Yeah, so you have actually that. answered it yourself. I just said art teaches you that many points of views are possible and your point of view is as valid as mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sir. Hello, may I ask a question please? Yes. Uh, we do have National Gallery of Modern Art in Bangalore and they do a lot to in encourage children coming in there and working and take, taking them around looking at the paintings. So I think they are doing a wonderful job. I'm from Bangalore. My question is, how does the government allow you to use public places for display of your art? How the government allows me? The public places. Yeah, I don't ask for them. For art installation. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't ask them. <laughs> that is because uh, for me, when I play, I mean on a beach, it is like a child playing. An artist is essentially a child. And I do my play on the beach. And uh, that is just for a little while. And so I don't ask the permission. Sir, here. Yes, I, yes, I just yes, want yes. to I just want to share a beautiful story in 40 seconds yes. about a great artist, a, a Brazilian uh, painter who went to some place, something like Kenya or some black underdeveloped uh, country, and they are all working in two and a half tons of garbage, waste garbage. Yes. He met all of them, became very friendly, took paintings of all the garbage with the people for 40 days. The, he invited them to Portugal. He made some millions of dollars. He gave all that money to that poor people. Oh, very nice. I had soft to him. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So, is your work minimistically inspired? Inspired by? Minimalism. Yeah, I think uh, minimalism is uh, actually ultimately where you must arrive. The most interesting thing is simple, simple and simple. So, I try to make it as simple as possible. Then, sir, how do you inspire yourself to produce like such deep I have work? a lovely wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I would like to actually, I must, I must tell you this. My museum, I, I'm, I come from a, a middle class family. My father's retirement salary was 500 rupees. Then, because I became a doctor, I settled my family financially. I created a small gallery when I gave up my medicine. Then I sold it three years ago, a house which I had built 25 years ago for four crores. And instead of living happily ever after with this money, which most of my friends advised me to do, he said, you are 58 years old, what foolish thing to do to create a museum. I decided not to heed to that advice and we created this museum using all this money and it was the only money I had. And I created this museum and I am not living happily ever after, I am living happier ever after. <laughs> so, I think you need some kind of a passion and some kind of a purpose, yeah. Uh, how important is photography in your kind of uh, projects? Because even though you say they are temporary, they kind of captured in some kind of permanence with these photographs. Uh, yeah. If not for the photography, how else would it be yeah, captured? Photography is very, very important. So, I am, uh, you know, uh, many a times uh, in the art schools in India, most of them are outdated in the syllabi. Most of them. That's why I'm forced to sort of work hard and hard and send my son to London in a school, which I don't afford. Yeah? But uh, here, when you, you mentioned photography, actually, there cannot be departments in art. I use photography, I use sculptures, I use metal, I use nature, I use all kinds of materials to create my art. So, graphic art, sculpture department, uh, photography department, this is meaningless. Uh, there should not be any caste. I mean, photography is very important and so is technology. So in my art, everything sort of comes together, blends beautifully.
Yeah. Hello, sir. Yeah. So my question is, how important is it for an artist to be socially responsible? Because in your pictures, I could see that you have been a very socially responsible artist in making the public understand to come away from the stigma of treating the transgenders and also regarding the usage of plastics. So was it deliberate or just? It's, it's very, very deliberate. I mean, first of all, to become a good artist, first you have to become a good man. <laughs> that is the f most important thing. And the important thing is, I mean, uh, art is not about decorating somebody else's houses. Huh? So art is basically expressing what you feel, what you stand for. So I am very, very political. I, have, I take a stand. If I don't take a stand, for example, many times in the so-called television debates, we have some film actors say, no, we are actors, we are artists. We are not going to get into political issues. We are not going to speak about it. This is nonsense. I mean, how can I be in the middle of war and paint sunflowers? Huh? So if you are in the middle of a situation, you have to have an opinion. And art, is, art has a, is a tremendous weapon to uh, sort of communicate. And I think it was also mentioned by Raj Mohan Gandhiji. I mean, he said that use art to propagate. And I completely believe in him because, you know, when this, I did this uh, carpet of joy with 150,000 uh, bottles, uh, I was known in my village as an artist. But with this carpet of joy, every house knew me. And when I went to them to tell them not to litter, I was treated absolutely as a special guest. And so the power of art to communicate is tremendous. Yeah? yeah. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> just yeah. one last question. Yeah. Um, here, sir, on the right. Oh, on the yes, right. yes, 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 yeah. yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to commend you on the presentation. I think all of us really enjoyed it. Uh, well, I'm a student who is doing uh, design. And uh, honestly speaking, um, it becomes, right now, it becomes really difficult for us to start anything on our own without any kind of financial help. And it is very difficult to pursue a career in arts. So what is your tip to us? How do you think we no, can Art needs start? to be funded. In my case, I did not take I mean, uh, any money from the government. But that is for a simple reason that they did not give me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's because I am very vocal against the government, against the policies of the right wing, so I didn't get. But at the same time, art always has, it has needed funding, either from the government, from other social bodies, because earlier the kings funded it. I mean, the Sholas, I mean, the Skola sculptures, all it's funded by king. But there are many people who are funding. It is difficult, I know. But one has to, I mean, not, I mean when you are an artist, uh, you cannot think in terms of, uh, uh, I go sometimes for this so-called career guidance programs. So I hear things like, okay, if you become a doctor, you learn this much per month. If you become a dentist, you earn this much. If you become a dental technologist, you learn a little more. I know a dental technologist who has a BMW. These are kind of, this is a kind of advice given, which is nonsense. I basically believe that the only purpose of life is to be happy. And if you do something which you love to do, there is a possibility that you will be happy. If you do something which you do not like to do, you will be definitely unhappy. Okay. <coughs> I think we should stop at that. I will, first of all... I think we're out of time. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Subodh. Yeah. That was lovely. And thank you very much. I think I will end on one wonderful poem. I was many times asked, will your sculptures be remembered? Will these installations which are temporary be remembered? I will quote a Tagore poem. It is a beautiful poem. It says, when death knocks on my door, when death knocks on my door and says your time has come, I shall tell death I never lived in time, I lived in love. And when death asks me, when death asks me, will your sculptures be remembered forever, I shall tell death I do not know, but when I created them, I felt eternity. Thank you very much. <laughs>